In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to talk about surprisingly smoky firewood, clean clothes and hardened hands while in the woods, water purification by evaporation, iodine for wounds and water, investing time in leather working skills, is it worth it? And what's my philosophical starting point for bushcraft? Welcome, welcome to Ask Paul Kirtley, episode 54, and I'm back in lovely sunny Sussex, and it continues to be nice. We've had very little rainfall still, and um, things have greened up massively despite the lack of rainfall. We've had some heavy showers, some thundery showers, but overall we've had one of the driest Aprils and Mays in a long, long time. So. It's nice to be in the woods because we can actually sit on the floor <laughs> without getting soaking wet. Um, we can, you know, move around without being splodging around in mud. It's actually been a really nice spring and it's continuing to be a really nice start to the summer. So back in the woods after being in Derbyshire on the last episode where I did the live Ask Paul Kirtley at the Bushcraft Show. If you've not seen that one already, check it out. That was a lot of fun to do. Lots of questions from a live audience without any prep at all they just fired their questions at me and that was really really fun to do and frankly that's all I pretty much do on these shows anyway yes I kind of gather the questions together but you know I sort of throw a, a selection together and um, try to to choose some that are not all in the same vein um, or some representative ones so if there are some rep repetitive ones I'll choose one but I don't really think about it too much I certainly don't go away and research my answers I just go right Get those onto my phone next time in the woods i'll sit down and answer them and so here we are and let's get started um the first question very quick one is via instagram and this is from bluefish 6900 and their question is will you be in canada in august Nova Scotia's bushcraft gathering is 10th to the 13th. Would love you to join us. By the way, really enjoy your blogs. So much of it is common sense, which isn't always common as it should be. Contact if you need more details. Well, unfortunately, I won't be in Canada in August. Um, I'm very busy here teaching courses through August. Um, I've got uh, an intermediate typically in, in August and I, I've got one again this year and we've got other courses around that. So unfortunately I won't be in Canada or anywhere near Canada, um, but it sounds like maybe something I could look into in the future and classy way of advertising your event, by the way, um, getting the details on my show. So well done. I hope it goes well for you and um, I look forward to maybe joining you at another point in the future. Next question, surprisingly smoky firewood. Now this is from Peter and I'm not sure where Peter is um, in terms of where in the world. So I don't have a lot of context for this question, but his question is, hi, I recently got some bone dry firewood that's been in my dad's woodshed for ages. Then when we threw it on the fire, I was surprised to see it generate an unexpectedly large amount of smoke. This happened at the start of the fire and when it had been burning for some time, i.e. it was hotter. What's going on here? Is it simply incomplete combustion? Well, yes, um, is the short answer. Um, but I would question the assumptions. Um, I don't know if it was bone dry, um, I've only got your word for it. And often if you have stuff left in woodsheds, it can be still quite damp. Um, outdoor storage is typically going to leave things relatively damp. 
and so it's possible it could still have some moisture. What you can do is get little moisture content testers for firewood that's got like two little prongs and they use conductivity um, to, to gauge, approximate the moisture content. And that's something that you can get for, for wood um, before it goes into your, into your wood burner, your log burner, whatever you're using. It's a cheap um, little electronic instrument. So maybe um, if you can get hold of one of those and you've still got some of the wood, maybe have a test. Um, also, one thing I would say is if it's still quite um, in the round in the woodshed, it could feel very dry on the outside, but it could hold a relatively large amount of moisture on the inside. That's one thing. I don't know what type of wood it was. It could be quite resinous. Um, pine, even when it's dry, will tend to give off quite a lot of black soot and can be a bit smoky. So I don't really know the context. I don't know the species. And also I'd question the assumption, maybe it wasn't as dry as you thought it was. You can test for that, but equally, even if it feels dry on the outside, if it hasn't been split, it could still be quite wet on the inside. So those are some things that I would maybe investigate. Clean clothes and harden hands. And this is from Rutger. And he asks, Hi Paul, um, I live in the Netherlands. I've been watching your show on YouTube from the start and find a lot of info very useful. Well, I'm glad you do, Rutger. Um, my questions are about care. The first one is about clothing. When on a long trip, you can only carry a finite set of socks and underwear, etc. How do I prevent from smelling too bad after a while? I know wool is, it takes a very long time before it starts smelling bad, but is too warm during summer, so it only works for winter. The second question is about skincare. Working in the woods with all the dirt and the rough surface on wood and such can be really demanding on the skin, on my hands. So I use a skincare cream to make a bit less sore. I don't like gloves in the summer because it gets hot and sweaty and hinders dexterity. Hope to hear from you soon. Rutger. Well, first part of the question. Yeah, uh, merino wool is good for not being itchy, but also not smelling. But you're right, in the summer, it can be a bit warm. Um, and if you're working and you're sweating, um, you might be wearing synthetics and they do get smelly quite quickly. Um, or you may be wearing a, a cotton shirt or a, a, a cotton synthetic mix shirt or, or whatever that allows you to, to stay cool. Now, a lot of people shy away from cotton in the outdoors because it's the death fabric. And yet, sure enough, if it's raining, if you're wet and cold, um, it's not going to help at all having cotton next to your skin. But on a hot day, when you're working hard, um, a bit of sweat into a cotton t-shirt and that evaporating off from you actually helps you stay cool. Um, so it, it, sw it swings around about, it's choosing the right clothing for the right environment. Um, also quite thin um, synthetic uh, trekking shirts are quite good for the summer, but again, they can start to smell a little while, after a little while. Um, the simple answer is you've got to stop and do some washing. Um, particularly in the summer, your feet get more sweaty. You've got to wash your socks. Um, you've got to air your feet out in the evenings. Um, your socks can get crusty on the inside quite quickly. You need to wash them, but it's summer, so you can dry them quite quickly. Same with underwear. Yes, you can only take a, a, a small amount. You can't take, you know, if you're going for a two week trip or a three week trip or a four week tri trip, you can't take you know, scores of pairs of, of underwear and socks, you're gonna have to stop and have a wash day or stop early one day when there's a warm afternoon, wash your stuff, leave it out to dry so it's good to go. That's the simple answer. And you can just, you know, carry a bit of soap with you that you can use for personal hygiene as well. And just take the opportunity to get clean yourself, wash your clothes, so one, you know, you only really need a couple of pairs um, if you're washing things on a regular basis. So you stop a little bit early, maybe have a wash yourself, put on some clean clothes and wash your dirty clothes. That is a simple routine that you can do. And if you're doing that um, on a regular basis, I mean, you can get away with kind of every three days, but you know, with the socks, maybe on a more regular basis. It depends on how hot it is and how sweaty your feet are getting and that type of thing. On canoe trips as well, it's very easy. Stop in the afternoon before the sun goes down and before the insects come out, maybe at dusk, have a wash, jump in the water, have a swim, um, get freshened up, 
get some clean clothes on in the evenings, clean, you know, wash the clothing that you've been wearing during the day that's full of sweat and get that dried before, uh, before nightfall. You just have to do that. Um, you know, lots of people go out for the woods for the weekend or maybe three days or maybe even a week and you can get away with just letting yourself and letting your clothing deteriorate really. By the end of a week, you're gonna to start to be smelling quite bad. You might start to get some soreness. Your feet might be starting to deteriorate. You might be starting to get to some soreness in the groin area if you're not washing. Um, you can get away with that to the extent that if you're going home at the end of the week, you can recover once you've got home. But if you're out for any longer than five or six days, you need to have a routine where you, you're having a proper wash yourself and you're cleaning your clothes. It's that simple. Um, onto the hands, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's more wear and tear on, your, on you and your hands in the woods than it is at home. Um, but your hands do toughen up. Um, for me, at the beginning of the course season, when I haven't been doing so much over the winter, you know, I've been out in the winter, but you know, in the summer I'm teaching a lot, I'm doing things, I'm doing a lot of techniques with roots and bark and carving and lots and lots of things with my hands all the time. The skin toughens up, the skin toughens up and it gets more leathery to the extent where things, you know, you can be moving things, you know, holding onto something hot in a hot mug that would burn you normally. Um, but once your skin toughens up, it can handle it and then you don't get the the problems what what i do is once the the problem i do have is once the skin starts to toughen up particularly on the tops of my fingers here if it's a bit um dry so if my hands get dry if, if i'm say on a canoe trip and it gets um if it's hot sunny windy drying on the skin hands are getting wet hands are getting dry i do tend to get a few cracks in the skin and what i find then is yeah, if you've got some, some sort of skin cream or somebody's got something like Neutrogena with them, that's fine, you can use that. I've got some Swedish lip salve, hood salve, which is really good on cracked lips. And I tend to just put a bit of that um, just to soften the skin so it doesn't crack every time, um, every time it bends. Um, and then it, when I've had injuries to my hands and they're not healing properly, I've documented this before, you know, I use things like balsam fir and there are saps of some of the the uh, pinaceae you can use, they've got healing properties. And there are other plants which have got healing properties as well, but I found particularly on my hands, that a bit of sap from uh, balsam fir or something similar where you are helps as well. And, that, and that's what I do. The other thing that's important as well, going back to the first part of the question is personal hygiene, keeping your hands clean as well is important um, because you don't want to get infections. If your hands do get cracked or you do get little cuts, little lacerations, little um, puncture wounds from thorns and things, you don't want really dirty hands in those conditions. You want to try and keep as clean as possible. Um, another bit of, a bit of advice, you can carry a tiny little nail brush as well. Um, they're handy for getting nice and clean. Keep your nails short, keep them clean, keep your hands clean, it's really important. Water purification by evaporation. And this is from Brett and his question is, Hi Paul, I'm from Australia. I enjoy your shows and the information and advice that you give. In regards to water purification, something that seems to be missing is evaporation technique, whereby simply boiling water over a fire and something as simple as placing a rag or a cloth over it to catch the steam rising. This method, would it work for seawater and processing dirty and contaminated water? Keep up the good work, Brett. Um, so I'll approach that in a couple of ways, Brett, because the answer is slightly different, whether you're talking about um, fresh water or salt water. Uh, fresh water, um, you can just boil it. Uh, you don't need to evaporate it off and then collect it. Um, the issue that you might be concerned with is, uh, you mentioned dirty water, contaminated. Um, if it's visibly dirty, you need to put it through some sort of crude filter. Uh, and by crude, I mean something that isn't necessarily gonna filter out pathogenic organisms like microscopic organisms but will filter out floating dirt, uh, floating organic matter, floating silt, that type of stuff. And you can buy 
Um, the old mill bank bags for that or the new brown bags. Um, easy to get hold of the brown bags these days. It's just like an old mill bank bag. Um, I can link to that in the show notes. I'll do a, I haven't done a link on YouTube for a while, but I'll link on YouTube through to the brown bags. You can get those and they're very, very good and they will remove sediment. So if the water is visibly dirty, if it's turbid, put it through something like a mill bank bag, like a brown bag first. Okay, and that's to remove the sediment. You then still need to boil it to kill the pathogenic organisms, um, protozoa, bacteria, and maybe viruses. Neutralize all of those by boiling. And then you can drink the water. You don't need to evaporate it and recollect it or anything like that. If you didn't have a coarse filter, I would use something like a trouser leg or a few layers of, um, few layers of t-shirt or something like that to try and get as much out as possible a few layers of bandana that type of thing is it's easy enough to get a lot of material out something that's going to get the particulate matter away from the water separate them out and then boil that's that with salt water the issue is the salt and that's where maybe you're thinking about distillation processes and yeah i mean a way of doing it is to boil off the water and for them to recollect the water somehow um, afterwards without the salt in it, because if you evaporate the water off, you tend to leave the salt behind. I don't know how much you're gonna end up with salt in a, a cloth if you put it over the top. Um, you can try it. It's not something I've tried. The methodology generally, if you're gonna try that at all, is to evaporate the water off, collect it, into maybe put a funnel over the top of something into a tube and then the tube you get the steam going into the tube and then you cool down the steam at some point and then it drips out as water and you tend to leave the salt behind that's a simple distill distillation process and that can work if you're on a on a seashore and you don't have any water coming onto the seashore um, or there is a high water table with a lot of salty water even if you're inland sometimes you can't get fresh water northern australia for example um, in some places so that's a technique the other technique you talk about evaporation the other technique that works really well in your part of the world because of the sunshine a transpiration bags so a tree or a bush or a shrub is going to be getting water out of the ground even if there's no visible water it's going to have roots in the ground and it's going to be sucking up water out the ground and the way that it sucks water out the ground is kind of by creating a vacuum in the plant water evaporates off from the leaves of the plant and then that evaporation the water going out then sucks up effectively water through the plant up through the roots so you can collect that water from the plant that's evaporating off if you have some polythene bags preferably clear polythene bags so you're kind of like creating a small um, greenhouse around the the foliage now it's important that the foliage isn't toxic you don't want to do it on toxic plants but if you could get a big sort of bin liner sized uh, transparent bag over a good amount of foliage tie it off at the branch and then have it weighted so the the water evaporates um, off from because you're still getting the sun onto the leaves because it's that's why it needs to be clear onto the leaves that evaporates off but then it hits the polythene and then it wants to run down the inside so you want to have it so that the bottom it is weighted so maybe put a little pebble in the bottom to hold it down you could even you can also tie the branch down so it's a bit more bent over but basically you want the the um a little bit like if you leave a bottle of water that's half full in the sun you'll notice that you get condensation on the inside above where the where the water is you have that same effect the water evaporates off the leaves condenses on the inside of the plastic and then you want to encourage it to run down into one spot pool at the bottom and you can collect quite a lot of water that way in an otherwise difficult environment in terms of water so you know in your environment a few big transparent plastic bags would be part of my survival kit for sure Transpa transpiration bags it's transpiration which is that evaporation and pull in the plant so that's another use of evaporation in terms of getting water Iodine for wounds and water. This is from Jamie Dakota. And Jamie says, um, he really enjoyed the Kevin 
uh, trip uh, on the Spey, the Kevin Callan trip. Um, his question is, iodine is a wound treatment when in the outdoors. I really like to hear your thoughts on its use for cuts and abrasions before closing and dressing a wound. I haven't felt like I've needed to carry it before, but as hopefully I'll be traveling further afield in future and perhaps canoeing in waters with Giardia, etc. I wonder whether having a small measure of povidone iodine in my cuts kit would be sensible. I could also double as a water treatment it could also double as a water treatment as a backup should i be separated from my main rucksack i suppose the heart of my question is i know iodine isn't generally used in the eu anymore for water purification and i have been taught that it isn't recommended as a typical first aid situations is it considered an outdated method or is it still a valid option thanks again for all that you do in the field of bushcraft um yeah i think um carrying some iodine in your first aid kit is a good thing um it's uh, the, so the povidone iodine, iodine treatments. Um, I carry a little vial of betadine um, and I tend to pick that up when I'm outside of areas where you can't buy it anymore. So Australia is somewhere where I get hold of it and I keep it in, in my first aid kit, just a little brown vial. Um, it's good for putting on, um, I don't tend to put it on cuts so much um, but I put it on bites, particularly in warm, uh, warmer climates. Um, I've also found it's effective at getting leeches off. You just put some betadine around where the leech is attached and it just de de detaches itself. And then you've got, as soon as it detaches, you've got that betadine going into the bite area straight away. So I found it useful for that. Um, you can put a splodge on when you've, if you've had a tick bite. Um, I think it's good just to get something um, that's quite um, uh, pathogenic, if you like, to, uh, to the pathogens. Um, so something that is going to kill any bacteria that's in there in, in particular as a result of the bite, that's generally a good thing. So I tend to use it for that. Um, the, the issue with iodine sometimes is that it can, uh, with any um, antiseptic that's going to kill cells, that's gonna kill living cells, living organisms, is that if you put it on a wound, it can damage the cells on the edge of the wound and therefore slow down wound healing. So you've got to sort of measure that up, which is why I don't have, um, you know, antiseptic creams are, are not great. And also they are not um, sealed once you open them. So there's issues there with smearing on Savlon and that type of thing. But betadine I like, um, particularly if they're puncture wounds, if I've had thorns and, um, or, or splinters and that type of thing, uh, it's useful for that. Um, anything where I fear it might be infected as a direct impact of the actual mechanism of the wound, then I will, put, I will use it. Whereas if I cut myself with a knife, for example, I'm not going to put loads of betadine in there because as long as my hands are relatively clean in the first place and it bleeds, i.e. flushes it out, um, there's, there's, there's not a lot of chance I've introduced bacteria in there unless maybe I'm preparing game or something. So I tend to, I tend to keep it for that. Um, what's also good in bigger kits, uh, although you can get small sheets, if you've got a, a, a more serious wound, um, you've got a burn, um, you're concerned about something getting infected, inodine gauze is good. So it's basically a gauze that's impregnated with a, with a gel and it's also got iodine in there. So having some inodine in your first aid kit is good as well and I, I like that. Um, using the betadine as a water purification treatment, I wouldn't do that. Um, you'd be better off actually using a water uh, treatment specific dosage and delivery mechanism than dripping an antiseptic uh, lotion, an antiseptic treatment into, um, into your drinking water. Because you also don't know what else is in there um, in that mixture. So get some portable aqua or other iodine tablets if you want to use iodine or use chlorine dioxide. Chlorine dioxide works well in applications where you might be using iodine anyway. Um, in terms of your question about giardia, the, the, the mechanism of entry of giardia into the body is orally. So um, you don't really need, you're not going to get giardia from 
paddling with a cut on your hand in areas where there's giardia in the water, you're going to get it from drinking water without um, purifying it first. Um, that said, the thing you need to worry about in some places is vials disease and that can get into the body through cuts and abrasions. So again, you want good waterproof plasters and maybe there again, the use of betadine would be, uh, would be good to try and keep the, the wound as sterile, sterile as possible. So um, it's horses for courses, slightly different techniques for different environments, whether it's tropical, whether it's warm, whether you're getting bites, whether you're getting cuts. But I, I definitely think a little thing of that betadine in your first aid kit generally is a good thing. Get some inodine as well. And if you need water purification stuff, get that separate. Um, and that, that will be my advice. Investing time in leather working skills. There's a few little midges or gnats coming out now, getting me in the, uh, get me in my hair. Um, this is from, Lewis or Louis, uh, forgive the pronunciation, one of those will be right. Um, Louis Pierce. And the question is, um, uh, hi Paul, myself and a good friend of mine are going into making bushcraft knives and we are troubled with the sheath. Neither of us have experience with leather working. So is it worth investing time and money into developing leather skills or look for alternatives? If so, what could some of these be? Cheers, Paul Lewis. Um, well, if you're gonna, if you want leather sheaths for your knives, you're either gonna have to make them yourself, or you're gonna have to get somebody else to make them for you. And either are, are a valid option. Um, I, I personally don't have a lot of leather working skills. You know, I, I'm not well practiced in it. But I think it is nice to do a bit of work with leather if you have anything that's made of leather, because then you've got a better idea of how to fix it if stitching comes undone while you're on a journey, whether it's on your sheath, whether it's on your boots. Um, I think it's a good thing to know how to do um, a bit of, you know, stitching leather, working leather. Um, and it's not that difficult, really. To do it really well and to make it, everything look perfect and fantastic straight stitching, really clean lines on the leather, really nicely formed. Of course, there's a real art to that, but just in terms of turning out something functional, it's not that difficult to do. So it, it's worth having a, a play around with and then deciding whether or not you wanna go further with the, the skill set, or whether or not you're just happy with turning out something functional. Depends whether you're just making knives for yourself or whether you're making knives for for sale commercially, you know, what standard you want to work to, I guess, to, to an extent. Or you could find somebody else who really wants to do a lot of leather work and can make kni uh, knife sheaths for your knives. That's another option. And then I guess if you're looking for alternatives completely, um, the other alternative, of course, that a lot of people use is Kydex, um, you know, to make plastic sheaths. So that's, that's your other option, really. Um, and again, there's some skill in, in producing Kydex sheaths. It's a different skill to the leather sheaths, but it's something that you could look into. Um, and those would be my, my, uh, my recommendations. I can't really think of much more to say other than that. Okay, here's a question from Robin. Robin, and you asked the question at the live session that we put out last week as well. So two questions in a row, but this is from a little while ago. And this question is, um, I recently read a bushcraft blog where the blogger seemed to be more interested in discrediting other bushcraft folk. He was particularly disparaging of Dave Canterbury and his heavy kit. I realized that Dave comes from a background of historical recreationalism uh, or, rec or historical recreationalism or I'm not sure whether you mean recreationalism like like old-fashioned recre recreationalism or whether you mean historic recreations so historical reenactment I'm not quite sure wh which you mean there um, and that helps to create his philosophical view of bushcraft my question is what is your philosophical starting point with bushcraft um, well, it's quite simple really. Uh, my philosophical starting point with bushcraft is that at the heart of the study of bushcraft is a study of nature, um, a practical study of nature, a study of practical uses 
of the natural materials that are around you in an environment, whether that's trees, plants, fungi, animals, um, further the celestial world, what's there, sun, moon, stars, using those, the sea, fish, etc. So all of those natural resources that are available to you, how do you practically make use of them so that you can be at home in the wilds? Now, that's the core, that's the core, that's at the heart of it. Now, whether or not you use modern lightweight equipment, older fashioned leather, canvas, stainless steel, copper, pots, whatever you want to do, is, is to an extent it's an equipment choice. It's an aesthetic and it is also about what you're trying to do. Are you going for durability? Are you going for ultimate lightweight? You know, does it just need to last the trip? Does it need to last a lifetime? And there's something there. How critical is weight? Some, some applications weight is super critical. Other applications weight is not super critical. I don't think there's anything mutually exclusive about being a lightweight hiker on a long distance trail, subscribing to the philosophies of say Ray Jardine and some of the ultra lightweight hiking stuff, you know, rucksacks without lids and all that kind of stuff because that's separate from bushcraft. It doesn't change how you might light a fire. It doesn't change you, your understanding of natural navigation. It doesn't under, change your understanding of tracking. It doesn't, understand your, it doesn't change your understanding of foraging. Um, it, it's the same skill set. And equally, if you're doing a canoe trip and you've got a traditional canvas portage pack and uh, stainless steel cooking pots and an ax and those things with you, the, the skill set's the same. The context is different. The equipment choice for some of those contexts can be varied from one person to the next, depending on their personal preference, depending on their personal aesthetic. Um, and so for me, the core of it is about nature and nature's resources. So that's my philosophical starting point. And that allows me a huge amount of flexibility of then how I apply it, which is what you want at the end of the day. And that is it. That brings us to the end of episode 54. So we got through quite a lot there and appreciate the questions. And it's a lovely evening here in Sussex and the birds are singing. And I look forward to seeing you on the next episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. Now, if I could ask a favor of you, if you are watching this on YouTube, please like the video, please subscribe to my channel. That makes the videos more uh, visible to other people who might also benefit from them. It really benefits me as well. So you'll get to know about the next video when it comes out and other people will get to know as well. So please like and subscribe if you don't already. That's super, super, super important. If you're listening to this as an audio podcast, please could you subscribe by some means. Um, iTunes or some other podcast platform that it's distributed to. So you might be listening to this on my blog, which is great, but if you've got access to iTunes or some other podcast platform that you, you also listen to podcasts on, please subscribe to these podcasts via those means. Again, it raises the profile of this series of podcasts if, you, if you're in the audio world. And that then means that other people have it as a suggested podcast in their feeds, etc. That benefits me, of course, because I get more listeners and it also benefits the right people because they get to benefit from the content. And this is what this show in particular is all about. It's about people sending in questions and rather than me answering that one person via email or a tweet or a Facebook message, nobody else really getting the benefit. It's about those questions coming in and me broadcasting the answers so that as many people as possible can get the, get the benefit. So the more we can share the love as it were, the better it is for everyone in that respect. So if you value these shows, then other people that are like you will value them as well. So if you can subscribe on your preferred platform, then that would be much appreciated. And also, again, I bang on about Instagram from time to time, still loving Instagram, still sharing almost like little mini blog posts on Instagram. I'll put my um, little tag there, Paul Kirtley on Instagram, quick flash of my feed there. You can see the sort of 
photos that I put there. I try and do those on a regular basis, um, certainly more regularly than I can put things on my, the longer form stuff on my blog. So if, you, uh, if you're missing out, if you're not getting as, as much as you need from my blog, um, follow me on Instagram as well, it'd be much appreciated. And again, the more followers I have there, the more um, I get shown and suggested to other people who might benefit as well. So you benefit and other people do too. So I really appreciate you following the podcast and me on Instagram. It'd be much, much appreciated. And that's it for this week. I will see you on episode 55 of Ask Paul Kirtley. Enjoy your week. Enjoy the summer in the Northern Hemisphere. And hopefully it's not too harsh for you if you're in the Southern Hemisphere. See you soon. Take care. Bye.